So, um, as John said, my name is Mark Billinghurst. I come from Adelaide in Australia. For those who don't know who Adelaide is, um, it's that um, red circle right there. And um, I actually didn't get on a plane yesterday. I got on a plane the day before yesterday. So I flew from Adelaide to Sydney, um, and then from Sydney to uh, Los Angeles, then, of course, to Seattle, and then New Jersey, <laughs> uh, and to Newark in New Jersey, um, and uh, finally um, here. So it took me... Um, 35 and a half hours to travel here, and I travel almost 11,000 kilometers to give you this 20-minute <laughs> talk. Um, and I left, of course, the sunny Adelaide. It was about 95 degrees. Um, <laughs> and Boston, I guess today's about 30-something degrees. So it's a little bit of a sacrifice. So why would I do that? Why do I, why do I travel 11,000? And by the way, it's going to be 35 and a half hours back again. So almost two weeks of travel and work time to come and, and spend two days um, with you. So why, why would I do that? Why would I spend all that time on a plane and security and weather and all that type of things? Well, the reason why I did that is, is um, because of you. So it turns out uh, the author, John A. Pierce, said that communication is not only the essence of being human, but a vital property of life. And it also turns out that technology today isn't very good at supporting communication. So in face-to-face -face communication, we use a wide variety of cues. You know, we have a lot of audio cues, uh, prosodics, um, speech patterns. Um, we have visual cues, gaze, gesture, body language, and cues about the environment. We point at objects, or we grab things, and we sketch, and so forth. So here's all the cues we use to communicate when we're face-to-face. -face. But when we're remote, um, a lot of those cues get degraded and don't work anymore. We can't transmit them. So here's a, a bunch of different teleconferencing tools people typically use today. Uh, if you're very lucky, you may have an iBeam robot that you can wheel around remotely, or you know, many people use uh, FaceTime or high-end Cisco teleconferencing systems or, or Skype. But with most of those systems, they have some problems. Um, for, for example, there's a big lack of spatial cues. When you're looking at Skype, it's very hard to segment the person on the Skype video from the background. So you lose a lot of the gesture or, 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 or nonverbal cues you'll have in face-to-face -face communication. Now, if we go forward to um, teleconferencing and, and science fiction, we can see how augmented reality is used to overcome many of these um, limitations. You can see the Jedi Council. We have one of the Jedi sitting presumably thousands or millions of miles away as this uh, 3D uh, augmented reality image. And in the recent Kingsmen um, movie, you can see their council again sitting around uh, this table. So unlike um, with uh, Skype or with uh, FaceTime or the other tools we have today, in this case, augmented reality is used to enable us to have a rich uh, spatial sense and have a lot of nonverbal communication cues that aren't captured or shared um, any other way. And, and most importantly, um, we overcome that seam between the digital and physical world. You know, John showed that really great picture of his daughter in, in, the, um, in, in the museum looking at her screen, um, oblivious to what was going around her. And it's the same for us when we're looking at our screens doing FaceTime or Skype or whatever. We ignore the world around us. But augmented reality allows us to come back to that world. So if you want to make that real, you know, if you'd gone to see the Kingsman movie and you decided that you wanted to make it really work, Here's some of the things that you'd need to have. You'd have to have some sort of unobtrusive AI display. And the Kingsmen, they all get these special pair of glasses that when they look into the real world, they can see augmented reality. Um, some sort of uh, tracking so that as you look around, the um, virtual uh, colleagues are fixed in space. You need to capture um, yourself or others in some way so that you can transmit a 3D volumetric rendering of you and, of course, some sort of um, high bandwidth a network. So many, many pieces of technology all have to come together to make uh, the virtual uh, Jedi appear to sit beside me on, on the table. So it turns out that I, myself and others have been working on this for almost 20 years. So if we go back to the late 90s, um, we developed um, the first um, live video texture AR conference system in the world. And then 20 years since that time, you can see some evolution from having flat video to uh, volumetric video. Um, CNN did a live broadcast in 2008. And then very recently, Microsoft, with their holoportation video, made a very impressive demonstration of 3D geometry um, volumetric um, sharing. This is great. OK. So um, this is the work we did in 2002. Um, can you put the audio up as well? There's a, a sound coming on this. So in this case, this person's making a Lego um, demonstration, and he's calling for a remote hey, assistance. So you can see this um, video, live video texture of a, a woman who's helping him um, do his uh, video, his Lego assembly. And uh, she appears um, fixed in the real world. 
Now, one of the interesting things that happened when we made this was it creates a really strong sense of presence that the person's really there. In some of our user studies, we did a study comparing this to monitor-based virtual reality, or, sorry, video conferencing. In the monitor video conferencing, the person would often lean closer to the monitor to feel like they had to speak more closely to the microphone so the person could hear them. When we showed them this, the people would shoot back automatically and give them the same space as they would in the face-to-face -face, uh, conversation. So that was um, 16 years ago. And more, most recently, this is um, Sharam Azadi from, at the time, Microsoft. And he's introducing the holoportation project. In this case, they have multiple stereo cameras that surround a real person. And he's able to use those cameras to capture that person in real time and share the geometry. So you can see this um, person in the check shirt is actually in another room. And when he puts this, um, when he puts his um, HoloLens on, he can see uh, the person appearing in front of him as an augmented reality, a 3D model. So the main, uh, main innovation of this compared to our original work 16 years before was that now instead of having a flat uh, 2D video texture, you have a life-size 3D person that has um, strong uh, virtual um, and non-verbal cues. So that's pretty much the state of the art for today. So if you want to, to make that Kingsman for real, if you look at the different pieces of technology, it turns out we have many of the pieces um, already available. So for example, um, here's some displays. This is the, um, it's kind of almost there. This is the most recent uh, Loomis, uh, sorry, Vuzix Blade display that was shown at CES. And you could see you could walk down the street with these glasses on and people wouldn't look at you a second uh, chance. Of course, with tracking, um, with the recent release of AirKit and AirCore from Apple and, and Google, we've got some very excellent tracking solutions. With Capture, as you saw from Microsoft, other companies like Mimesis here can let you do real-time 3D geometry capture of people. So that's um, kind of the solved problem, and the networking is um, we're doing very well on. So with these various pieces we've got together, if you wanted to make the Kingsman demonstration, within a year or two of now, you could make it work, because all the pieces are coming. But actually, the more exciting thing is to go beyond being there. You know, for, for video conferencing, the holy grail was always to try and make it so the person who was on the other continent was um, able to be appearing like they were face to face with you in the same room. But it turns out, using augmented reality, you can go beyond being there and do things that you can't do if they're face to face with you in the same room. So for example, you could change your body scale. You could move inside somebody else's body because that, that other body is just a virtual image. You could interact with content, you could copy yourself, you could share different communication cues. So let me show you some examples of, of that. So uh, last year, we did a, a, a mixed space collaboration project. In this case, we took a, a real uh, lab, our, our lab, and we made a virtual copy of the lab. And then we put a person in the real lab in augmented reality and a person in the virtual copy in virtual reality. And when the person in the augmented reality um, interface looked around, they would see the virtual person standing beside them in the real lab. And the person in the virtual world would also see the virtual uh, person standing beside them of the augmented reality user. So they both got the sense that they were sharing the same space. And then we provided them with some communication cues that you wouldn't normally have in face-to-face -face communication. In this case, we shared uh, these field of view lines. So in normally face-to-face, -face, I can only see where you're looking when I'm looking at your face. But in this case, because we're sharing a view frustrum, even when I'm not looking at you, I can tell you where you're looking because I can see this uh, view frustrum out of the corner of my eye. And we supported this with uh, large room scale tracking and gesture based interaction. So this is the video of the system working. What you'll see here, this is the augmented reality view. So I'm looking at the, um, my collaborator. I see these blue uh, lines coming out of his face. And that shows the view frustrum. This is the virtual reality view. So again, to look at my collaborator, I can see where they're looking at me. Now, these, uh, these uh, lines here show what the person's looking at, in this case, these cubes here. And we had this task where we had to move cubes around. So here's my collaborator beside me. But even when he's not in view, I can still see what he's looking at because I can see that view frustrum. So I can do something I can't do in face-to-face -face communication through the use of augmented uh, reality. You can also uh, change your body scale. So you know, in a normal uh, world, you'll both be the same scale. But you might have some applications where you might want to be um, very uh, small. So maybe you have an application where you have to search for objects. And you want to shrink yourself down very small and look through this virtual world trying to find small objects. Or you might want to make yourself very big. And so maybe you can imagine an application where you're like a fire chief and you've got many people with you in the virtual world and you want to be like god size so you can see all the people at once and tell them where to go. So again, with our system, we built this working as well. So you can see on the, the left-hand side is the VR user's view, or the right-hand side is the AR user's view. And we've got a simple app where you can drop uh, spheres and, and uh, cubes down. But then you can change your body scale. So you'll see in a minute the VR user will um, push the slider and change his body scale to be four times what it was in the past. 
So here it goes. Oops. Sorry, the video is running quite slow. Not quite sure where that is. Um, the virtual person um, um, changed himself to four times the size and shrunk himself down to a quarter of the size after that. So um, both of those are examples of how you can use augmented reality to do things you can't do in the real world. One of the most exciting things, though, is, is going from telepresence to teleexistence. So telepresence is where you feel somebody else is in your space, a remote person is present in your space, where teleexistence is giving you the feeling that you are in a remote place yourself. And so, of course, there are many applications now that um, uh, cr try to create that teleexistence experience. So things like Periscope or Facebook Live, where they live stream video to you. Um, a PTC has this, has this very nice application called Project Chalk, where you can uh, take a live video feed from a um, remote person and then annotate that. So it's almost like you're reaching across into their space and drawing in their view of the real world. And similarly, um, Lime from Viper does the same thing with your hands. But in this case, they're only showing this on a handheld display. It turns out when you take the camera and put it in your head, like what's ha what happened with um, Google Glass, something special happens, and you can have this ego vision collaboration where you can live stream what you're looking at to a remote person. And the remote person kind of feels like they're looking through your eyes. But one of the disadvantages with that is that they can only look through your eyes. They can't look anywhere else. So if, they, if you're looking in one direction and something interesting is happening somewhere else, then the person at the other end, unfortunately, has to look where you're looking. But uh, this year, we did develop a system called ShedSphere. In this case, what we do is we live stream a 360 video to a remote person. So here's a person with an augmented reality display, live stream a 360 video to a remote person in the VR display. And then we capture their hands, and we send their hands back. So in the AR display on the left, you can see uh, virtual hands floating in space in front of you. In the VR display, of course, you see the video of the real hands. And then you can communicate with each other. So let's see if this video works. So here's the, the shared 360 view. Um, the red square there shows what the person who's wearing the 360 camera is looking at. But, um, and then there's, here's the, uh, the virtual hands of the VR user. But of course, the VR user can look around and look at different things. And here's the AR view um, of the AR user. And this uh, green square shows what, the, what the, um, the VR user is looking at. So if they're not looking in the same direction, these arrows appear and tell me where to look so I can line up with the other person. Theo, do you want me to bring And here they're going to start talking about moving around some, some apple. Um, fruit. But the key of this thing is that now, using this uh, technology, the remote person can really feel like they're standing um, inside the person's head um, in this other location, and then give them uh, audio and visual cues to help them perform certain tasks. One of the things I'm really excited with, though, and, and what's the main focus of our lab, is this a topic of empathic computing. So empathic computing is going one step further, and it's developing systems that allow us to share what we are seeing, hearing, and feeling with other people. So I've already shown you examples of being able to see and hear what somebody else is doing. Um, but we can also use technology to help share some of their feelings. So for example, last year we developed a system called Empathy Glasses, where we combined three technologies together, the Pupil Labs, Eye Tracker, an AR display, and the special pair of glasses called Effective Wear. And th these three combined together allow me to know exactly where the other person's looking, because we were using eye tracking. And also with these special Effective Wear glasses, what the face expression is and how they're feeling. And this changes the nature of video conferencing because it changes now, it provides these implicit cues. So when you look at something or when you make a face expression, you're giving an implicit cue that somebody else can look at and, and try and feel what you mean from that. So the key to this with these special glasses, you know, with um, cameras, you can recognize face expressions, but it doesn't help you when you've got a wearable system on your face, unless you have a camera on a stick that's pointing back at your face. So what we did is we took these. Um, um, photo resistor, photo sensors and put them um, on a, around a, a pair of glasses and then the photo sensors would detect the distance to your skin and as you start making different uh, face expressions we can recognize to 95% accuracy eight different types of expressions and then share that with the other person so they know when you're frowning or when you're smiling or when you're feeling happy. So when we put this whole system together, we combine that also with a heart rate sensor as well. So this is what the person's wearing. We stream this video back to the remote user um, the key parts of this is the, um, the green dot in the middle there is the remote user using his mouse pointer to communicate with this person, and the red dot is um, his eye gaze. So we can tell if the person's paying attention because if the red dot and the green dot are line up, it means the person's looking where you're telling them to look. But they may not be paying attention, and then we start wandering around. And we also share face expression and, um, and heart rate. So here's a video of the system working. Um, so you can see... Here's on the left-hand side is the remote collaborator. On the right-hand side, here's this person doing a kind of a simple block uh, picture task. 
where you have to arrange and make blocks together. So you can see the person on rem remote side is moving around their indicator, and then if you watch the red dot there, that'll show whether that person is paying attention or not. And this is really great because people always look at things before they interact with them. So now, instead of having just a camera on my head and not knowing exactly what the person's looking at, I know exactly what they're looking at, and I know when they touch the wrong wire or cut something they shouldn't be or, or grabbing something they shouldn't be, and I can warn them before they do that. I don't have to tell them all the time what to do. And here again is our uh, photoreflector sensors that detect the uh, face um, expression. So when we use the system, we found that by sharing those um, communication cues, the gaze cue and the face expression cues, people felt uh, much more connected with each other than they did if we took those cues away. So the final thing I want to talk about is technology trends. So, and we all know these trends. So we all know that, that the head mount displays and glasses are getting to a wider field of use, higher resolution. And we've got technology now that um, you can scan rooms and build 3D models. And, and within a year or two, you'll have some sort of small handheld device where you can walk into a room, push a single button, and capture a 3D model in a, in a few seconds. Um, there's really great examples of natural gesture interaction, of really robust um, eye tracking, and technology that allows you to recognize um, emotion. For example, um, this week or last week at um, CES, uh, Lucid showed off this head mount display that had EEG in it, had the motion sensing, had eye tracking all integrated into one display. Um, others like MTEC um, combine it, that's theirs on the top there, they combine EMG sensing. Neurable has um, EEG sensors at the back of the Vive. And here at the Media Lab with the Physio HMD project, they combine GSR, um, RPG, um, or PPG, sorry, and motion sensing all into one um, head mounted display. So within the next year or two, you'll see a number of companies releasing commercial products on the market that will know where you're looking and that will know how you're feeling, all with data capturing from the head mount display. So what does that mean? Well, it means we're heading towards a future of what I call empathic tele-existence. So we combine these advanced displays and space capture, natural gesture interaction, robust eye tracking and sensing all together. And that enables us to have a very different type of collaboration. So now people move from being observers to remote people to being participants. I can be with somebody inside their head while they're experiencing something, and I can experience the same thing. Maybe in the 2024 Olympics, you know, the mountain biker will be biking down the, um, the mountain bike track, and we'll, we'll be live streaming 3D geometry of what they're seeing at the same time, as well as their heart rate and their GSR and everything else. And I'm sitting at home with my VR or AR headset feeling what they're feeling as they're, as they're winning their gold medal. We also move from explicit to implicit communication. In face-to-face -face communication, um, more than half of what we share is by gaze and by nonverbal communication cues. And almost all of that is lost through uh, video conferencing. But with this type of technology, we can, we can have those cues again. I can know when your heart rate is going up. I can know when um, you're looking at a certain thing. Um, and I can know when, even if you're not in view, when you're um, showing certain face expressions. And this all together combines to produce a much stronger um, sense of experiential collaboration. So rather than just speaking together, we start enabling ourselves to be able to do things together and to engage in ways that we never had before. And, and through doing that, create a very strong sense of empathy so we can really understand what people are experiencing and create rich communication cues because of that. So just to wrap up, um, this is a kind of a big vision, and of course there are many, many directions for future research. We need to be able to evaluate these things uh, very carefully. We need to understand uh, what type of communication models we should be using to model the, this type, new type of communication patterns. There's lots of opportunities for novel interaction. Uh, most of the systems we built have just been collaborating between uh, peers or a few people. How do we scale that up so we can have hundreds or thousands of people collaborating together? How can we really capture and share emotions? Are psychological models of emotion correct right now? Should we have new models of emotion? How do we capture space and what applications can we do with this? So today what I've talked about is a vision of going from uh, using AR to go from telepresence to teleexistence to finally empathic um, computing. And this trend towards empathic computing, which all the various technology components are leading towards, and also many, many directions for future research. So I'm here for the next couple of days before I do my 35 and a half hour trip, 11,000 mile trip back home. I'd love to talk to you and I'd love to find out some of you who'd like to engage with me and, and join us in this trip towards building an empathic computing system. And here are all my uh, contact details. So thank you very much for your time. Woo! Woo! Thanks.